Tonight we are speaking on the prophetic. If you haven't been around, we have been going after a series called God's Got Answers, where we have really felt to tackle questions, issues, ideas that people generally have a lot of questions about. And prophecy is something that's really cool, it's really exciting, but also brings up a lot of questions. So tonight is our first night um, on the Holy Spirit. Next week we won't have an evening service because of comrades, um, but we will be starting the week after that with the next installment. Can I just ask if anyone here would like a prophetic word at some point tonight, can you please stand up? Lovely. <laughs> Prophetic team, I hope you're looking. <laughs> Guys, I, I want to encourage you that if, if to, to the, the, the prophetic people in the room, if you saw someone stand up, I want to encourage you to find someone that God wants to speak to tonight and give them a prophetic word. Because we want, to, in, in this church, what I love about this church is we are so passionate about hearing God's heart. And we really want you guys to experience that as well. I do have a couple of words for specific people, and then I'll get into some more topical words later. Where's Jill's? Where are you? I can't see you. Oh, there you are. <laughs> My friend, I really just feel like what God wants to say over you is, okay, I'll wait. <laughs> I just really feel like for you, friend, from glory to glory. I feel like you've just been so obedient, and I really feel like the Father is so pleased with you. He's so pleased with your sacrifice. And this is just an encouragement to say, like, you're doing amazing, my friend. There's so much grace over you, and I feel like, yeah, you've really made him proud. And the word that I felt for you is acceleration. And even in a space of uncertainty, I really feel like God is going to show up for you and show you that he is your rock, and he is your security. So I'm really excited to see you flourish, friend. Um, he is going to be your certainty, and yeah, more Lord. Can we just uh, extra, uh, reach out our hands to Jilly? Yeah, Jesus, I just want to bless this daughter of yours. I want to thank you for the sacrifice that she's made. We want to thank you for the fire that is on her life, Lord, and we want to ask for more. Amen. Abby, where are you at, girl? Friend, I really just felt fruitfulness for you. And I just feel like a season of joy over you, my friend. Where there's been weeping, let there be no more weeping. And for James, friend, I felt for you like the Lord has seen your sacrifice. And I really feel like he's, he's acknowledging that. So, well done, friend. Awesome. Okay, guys, so I'm really excited about this topic tonight. I think... Um, I feel like I was really going to move at the, the prayer meeting. It was, it was really popping off, and I'm, I'm excited to see. But um, as I, I've been preparing this message for quite a long time, and um, I was actually trying to figure out why the Lord was telling me to share what he wanted me to share on today. And even this morning, I was like, sure, Lord, I don't even know where you're going with this. And then I came to church, and Chanel started preaching. And then I figured out why. And God is so good. I mean, we're talking about having a prophetic evening, and Chanel uh, set, the, set the tone for us so beautifully today, friend. That was awesome. What an incredible word about finding where you are called and going with it, even when it's uncomfortable and it's uncertain. Um, your obedience is amazing, friend. It's just so, such an honor to know you. And I, I, I want to start by saying tonight that you were born for such a time as this. I feel like this is a word in the season for, our, for our, our province, for our people, for this area. You were born for such a time as this. I am very aware that the, the final election results were about an hour ago. And I, I'm just going to name it. I know that there has been a lot of uncertainty and a lot of perhaps fear, stress, anxiety. But I really feel so convicted that there is a reason that you were here tonight. You were placed here for a purpose. And just as Chanel was talking to us this morning about finding where that place is, if for right now you're here, yeah. and God has a purpose for that. And I've been thinking a lot about Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a, a king um, a long time ago. But he was a, a young man who took 
the throne at 25 years old. Like, who's 25 here? Can I have? Sure, Paige and Tristan, you guys, I mean, you you could be. You could be. (laughs) Prince and princess, there we go, of Hillside and DCC. (laughs) But Hezekiah was a young man with passion and fervor and perseverance. And his, his predecessors and his forefathers did not honor God. But here was a man who went against the grain, and he restored that faithfulness back to Judah. And it's an incredible story. And we don't have time to go into the detail, but you read chapters and chapters about how he restored worship and honor and dignity and restoration to his people. And his key message was consecrate yourselves Set yourselves apart. Make yourselves pure for the Lord. Let us come back to him again. What a powerful message. And can I say we can really learn from that. And we really need to learn from that. It only takes one person of influence to change a nation. That was one person who had the guts to go against what every other person had told him he should do. It was unpopular How many of you have experienced the feeling of knowing that you have to make a a good decision and it's not a popular decision? Now he has to lead a nation. You know, he started executing these things in his very first year of his reign. That's something really exciting and really powerful. So there was a story about how, you know, this man is doing so well. He initiated revival in his country. He restored his people back to the glory. And yet something really bad happened. A tyrannical king came and invaded his fortified cities. And this guy sounds like a real piece of work. I could could think of a few personality disorders we might be able to associate with him, but I won't get into that now. And this guy was threatening and he was menacing. And what Hezekiah did, he was strategic. He fought back. He thought, no, 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 not on my watch. This is my town. This is my city. This is my kingdom. No one's going to take that back from me. And this king was not impressed. So he came with an army, and he threatened, and he was conniving, and he taunted. He even said to the people, he said, why would you trust this king? Don't believe him when he says trust in the Lord. Rather make a plan with me. We'll, we'll make a plan together, don't worry. But the people didn't listen. They said nothing. They ignored this king. And Hezekiah cried out to the Lord. And the Lord answered his prayer. And the response was, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were gone. And not a single Judean sword was raised. God is the God of the impossible, and when he speaks and we listen, he responds. So I woke up um, this morning, well, actually at about two in the morning, um, with Psalm 27 running through my mind. And so I'm just going to be obedient to that and respond to it, because I really feel like God is wanting to, I feel like this is a word for our province in this time. And so if you wouldn't mind turning with me to Psalm 37. 37. And I'm going to read most of it, so bear with me, but I really feel like this is something really important that we can learn from. from. And I'm reading from the ESV, and it reads, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger. KZN, refrain from anger. We need to let that go. We need to let go resentment. 
Forsake wrath, fret not yourself, it only tends to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but for those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more, though you carefully look at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. And I'm going to stop there, but it's a, it's a beautiful psalm, so I'd really encourage you to keep reading it. And if you need a word in the season, it's this. Dwell in, in the land that God has put you in and befriend, befriend faithfulness. Trust what God is doing. And that's a great chance to practice the prophetic. And maybe you're wondering where I'm going with all of this. Usually when we talk about the prophetic, we have a bit of a teaching, and then we do a bit of an activation, and then some people give a whole lot of prophetic words, and we're going to get to that. But what I really feel like we need to go after tonight as well is we need to go after what is God's heart for our land? What is God speaking over us? And we are not for or against a political party at Hillside. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We love everyone but we do need to respond what God is speaking over our nation, and we have to respond urgently. There's a real sense of being commissioned, of being mobilized and being deployed, and I mentioned this to Jilly, but Jilly, Chanel, and the Cockrofts, I really believe it's no coincidence that you guys are all here in this season, and I really feel like there is a work for you guys to do, even the short time that you are here, that you are all going to be deployed, and you're gonna wreak havoc in the enemy's kingdom even in this season, so we just love and celebrate you guys. But we need to start paying attention because God is moving tonight. And I really hope you're feeling, feeling, ugh, feeling fired up because I'm feeling fired up. I'm even getting my words confused, <laughs> although I don't have to be fired up for that. So let's get on to prophecy, okay? If you're new to this community, if you're new to the church in general and you feel a little bit freaked out by it, that's okay, and I'm sorry, someone obviously has really misled you because prophecy in its, in its purest form is beautiful. It's safe. It's protective. It's listening to God's heart. It's 100% aligned with Scripture. And if it's not in line with Scripture, then I'm going to say it's not a prophetic word. But it really doesn't have to be complicated. My experience of the prophetic has never been complicated. I speak to God and He speaks to me. I tell him about the things that I'm processing, my big decisions, and he tells me what he thinks, but I don't move without his peace. And when I convince myself that I have peace, when I know deep down inside I don't, it's usually disastrous. The prophetic, in its most basic form, is God speaking and people listening. I had the privilege of growing up with very prophetic parents. Um, they're probably very embarrassed that I'm saying this. <laughs> you know, I heard a story, um, someone told me a story the other day of some really cool stories about how prophetic my dad is. And I was so surprised. And then I told him, and he was also surprised. <laughs> but that was because they never advertised themselves as prophetic people. They just spoke to God, they listened to him, and they taught us to do the same. It was just normal, and I feel like this is what we need to be going after. We need to stop complicating the prophetic. Just start listening to God and doing what he tells you. It's so easy. It's so, so easy. We have so many examples of prophets in the Bible. I could list a hundred, very tempted to. But most importantly, we have our beloved Jesus, King of kings, holy, holy of holies, prophet of prophets, who's prophesied his own death and resurrection, and that is the most powerful prophetic word that we will ever be witness to. And his ministry is something that we are still seeing today. And I shared this at the prayer meeting this morning, so if you weren't there, then uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here now. 
Pew Research Center did a study in 2010 and estimated that 24% of all the Christians in the world were residing in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, it doesn't sound like a lot. But they are estimating that by 2050, that number will rise to 38%. And what, why that's important is that that will make sub-Saharan Africa the, the area in the world with the most number of Christians by a margin of 15%. So all the prophets in the room who are remembering those uh, words about revival and Durban, guys, there is a reason that you are here tonight, because you are a part of a bigger prophetic story that you didn't even know you were a part of. You know, the earliest uses of the word prophesy refer to religious ecstasy that are only occasionally predictive in nature. So it's more about experiencing the overflow of joy from knowing the Father than it is about pre predicting the future. Jesenius uh, was, a, was a scholar back in the day, and he said that the oldest usage of this word refers to something bubbling up and pouring out words of abundance as done by those who speak with passion. And passion only comes from knowing and knowing something well. How awesome is that? It's interesting to, to think about the fact that Adam never needed a prophet because he was walking with God. He was close to him. He was expecting that God was going to show up in the cool of the day with him. And humanity's exit from the Garden of Eden was very unfortunately an exit from a kind of closeness that we only get a taste of again with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But away from the closest in the Garden, humanity starts to unravel. Passion outside of love leads to violence and tyranny. Passion in the context of love leads to adoration, prosperity, and acceleration into destiny. And so with the exit out of the Garden of Eden, Eve birthed Cain and Abel, and we all know what happened there. Bit of a disaster. And Abel lost his life at the hands of his brother. Can we have the first slide, please? It's maybe coming. Okay. So for those of you who usually skip over the genealogy, okay, I think that's the third slide. Can we have the one that says Cain, please? There we go. Okay. So for those of you who usually skip the genealogy side of Scripture, we're going to nerd out a little bit tonight, so bear with me. So in Cain's line, Cain had a son called Enoch. From Enoch came Erod. From Erod came, I'm going to try this one, Mehushael, from him came Methushael, and from Methushael came Lamech. Lamech had three sons, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm really proud of myself. Can I have the next slide, please? The one that says Seth. Okay. Then we had Seth. From Seth came Enosh, Enosh came Kenan, Kenan, Mahalalel, then Jared, then Enoch, then Methuselah and then Lamech. Does anyone notice any similarities? Okay, can I have the last slide, please? There we go. Okay. Now, I'm not a theologian. Um, <laughs> I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill here, but these similarities seem a little bit too alarmingly similar. And when last week this, this kind of hit me in the face, I thought, sure, we can't really skip over this. We have two bloodlines and six generations, but five of these generations either carry the same name or name that scholars believe are the equivalents of each other. We have two Enochs. Erod and Jared are thought to be derivatives of one another. Mehujael is equivalent to Mahalalel. Methushael is thought to be equivalent to Methuselah, and we have two Lamechs. Very interesting. What, one bloodline led to salvation and redemption through Noah's family, and the other was terminated in the flood. And scripture only makes mention of a few of these names and what they mean, but biblical, linguistic, and Hebrew scholars have long since identified what these names are, are most likely to have meant in those days. And in, Cain, Cain, in, excuse me, in Cain's bloodline, we have a line of sons who had prophetic potential, but the corruption of sin and disloyalty to God led them down a path of self-destruction. As a son of a, a murderer, a rebel against God in Cain, 
Enoch's name means disciplined or trained. And I have to wonder, if you're a son of a murderer, what are you trained in? What are you dedicated to? And maybe some of these things we'll never know for certain, but I can't help but wonder. Perhaps his own son, Erod, is the fruit of that dedication. Erod's name means the fugitive or the dragon. Erod's son, Mehujael, meaning destroyed of God. His own son, Methushael, is thought to have been possibly redemptive for his bloodline, but his own son, Lamech, falls again, and his name means powerful but unruly and wild. Not only rebelling against God and being the first person to go against God's order for marriage in being the first polygamist, but he's also the second murderer. And in Genesis chapter 4, we learn about how he boasts to his two wives about the young man that he brutalized. His two sons, his three sons, sorry, were inventors of music, brass instruments, and tented living. But their names suggest their inheritance. Their names mean to run away like water. You can't ever stop water. It just goes. And his third son, Tubal Cain, literally means producing Cain, is supposed to be the first person to produce metal weapons. Like father, like son, or great-great-grandson. And then we have the line of Seth. Seth was a man appointed, intentionally placed, producing Enoch. A man, uh, sorry, his his sorry, his son was Enosh was a man who seems to have acknowledged his frailty before God. His uh, Enosh means frail. It doesn't sound like a verb to be called frail, (laughs) but I feel like it's a great equivalent in comparison to his cousin on the other side of the family but it does reflect a posture of humility, a recognizing our weakness in humankind. Kenan, son of Enoch, refers to something fixed, secure, making a nest in a high place. It's the same root word to describe the rooms in Noah's Ark. Starting to see something prophetic here. It's almost like we're talking about prophecy. Mahalalel had a name that means the praise of God or blessed God. Jared, His son means to come down, and some scholars interpret this lineage as meaning, blessed God, come down, a prophetic declaration of God's redemption story that he had already initiated. Enoch, like his distant relative, had a name that means dedicated or disciplined. But unlike his relative, he was a man that walked so closely to God, and God was so enamored by his adoration that he overruled death for him. His son, Methuselah, the oldest man to live, means the the one who was sent. His name also means the man who is a weapon. And his bloodline was a powerful weapon against the enemy camp, spanning 969 years. The son of Methuselah was Lamech, who, unlike his relative in Cain's line, seemed to recognize the greater plan at play. And he prophesied over his son, Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Noah's name also sounds like the Hebrew word for rest. And it strikes me as no coincidence that Cain and Seth both named their children after the same things. And why is this important? Maybe both of them had prophetic potential. The difference was this. When you turn to Genesis 4, chapter 25. And it reads that Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and called him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born and he called his name Enosh. And here's the kicker. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And every person in this chair is filled with prophetic potential. There is a prophetic story, and I believe God has ordained that for your life. But either you walk into your destiny or you walk into your destruction. And the most predictable mediating factor is this, the submission 
to the Lordship of Christ. And this is a biblical principle. In Lamentations 1 verse 9, you really capture the heart of God's agony when his people go astray. And it reads, speaking of Israel, she took no thought to her future. Therefore, her fall is terrible. And Bill Johnson says, you know, to the degree that we have the potential for greatness, we also have the potential for destruction if we choose not to submit to him. And I feel such an urgency for some of us in this room at this moment. I feel like some of us are, are at a crossroads or you're on the edge of something. And I really feel so urgently, consider your steps. The heart of God for you, please consider where you are going and where your actions are taking you right now. God wants to rescue you and he wants to redeem you. Be very careful where you are going. I really feel like God is pleading with some of you tonight. Choose him. He's saying, please choose me. He desires you. He is passionately overflowing with words of adoration for you. And a life without the revelation of God's heart will always lead to destruction because anything outside of God is death. And our Western world has packaged it so nicely for us because we don't really need him. And we can be okay. But if you think greatness and complete fulfillment can be achieved outside of the almighty creator of heaven who has the earth as his footstool, then you are as gravely mistaken as those angels that fell out of heaven. You cannot survive. Why would we want to know anything less? And I know this sounds so harsh, but this is a harsh reality. And God is calling some of you out and out, and I think there are some people who are probably thinking, no, he's not. It is for you, and he is talking to you. If that is happening for you, please do not leave this room without speaking to someone. And I, I feel like, you know, you as individuals are not the only ones with prophetic potential. And I think we need to also zoom out and, and have a look at the, the bigger picture. Last weekend, Stephen and I were privileged to escape from the mountains, to the mountains, to Drakensberg for a few days. Um, and I'm also just convinced that those mountains are anointed. Every time I go there, I feel like the Lord's calling me to live there. <laughs> I, keep, I keep begging Steve. But I felt God start to highlight something about the land to me. And I, I remember I was sitting in the lounge and I was just looking up at that glorious mountain. And God was speaking to me about this mountain. I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying? The Drakensberg means the place of the dragon. Ukaslamba means the barrier of spears. And these names feel a bit painful. Violent even, if I may say. And then I was struck by the war and the bloodshed that the lands of KwaZulu-Natal have faced in the last few hundred years. Guys, it is ugly. There has been so much violence and so much destruction the South African war, wars between nations, genocide. Do you know that we had the world's first concentration camp in like Pantown during the South African war? Genocide, apartheid, political rivalry, unrest, flooding. Our land has been through so much. Death, division, destruction. And even in the last few months, we've been hearing so much of that. So much negativity, so much hopelessness. It is so easy to fall into it, but we have to watch our hearts so carefully. But yet KZN has also been named a place of birth. Did you know that? The first time Vasco da Gama sailed past our land, he named it after the day on which he sailed past it, on Christmas Day. Natal means birth. KZN is the birthplace of Albert Latuli, Pixie Ka Isaka Seme, and John Dube, ANC founders and founding presidents, 
numerous anti-apartheid activists and leaders, IFP founder Mangosuto Butelezi, Ladysmith Black Rombazo, and musical geniuses that are globally acclaimed. You know, the Battle of Spiencorp is, is thought to have seen General Louis Boerter, Winston Churchill, and Mahatma Gandhi at the same place at the same time in history. I believe, prophetically, that KZN is a land that births people of influence. We have had people come from this land that have changed the course of history. And let's not forget Hezekiah, and he was one man. We are a people who are called to be people of influence. Even our provincial coat of arms literally depicts the birth of Christ. It has a star of Bethlehem on it. The symbols of our coat of arms also represent unity, protection, wisdom, and peace. The provincial motto is, let us stand up and build. Guys, I feel like that's prophetic. Yeah. Do you know that the, the, the KZN um, capital, the city hall in, Man in Maritzburg, is built on a church? There is so much over our nation, guys, and so much over our province, and we actually need to stand up. We need to stop speaking negativity over this nation and over this place. Come on, guys. The word for us to dwell in the land is, respond, is, is resonating tonight for me, guys. I'm so fired up about this. I'm remembering in Jeremiah chap, uh, chapter 29, we all know that for I know the plans I have for you, that whole thing. But before that, God was saying to his people, you're in a place where you don't think you're going to find prosperity and joy right now because you're in captivity and it's painful. But I'm telling you, take authority, put down your roots, dwell in the land, seek the wellness of the land that you're in. And well-being and prosperity will find you. And I feel like we need to be doing more of that tonight. Bill Johnson, I love how the Lord just sometimes sends Instagram to me. <laughs> it's great. So this afternoon, the Lord sent me a video through Bill Johnson on Instagram. And he was saying that if God inhabits our praises, who is inhabiting our complaining? How the enemy is using our complaints to send through the, the theft, the death, the destruction. Guys, we are speaking it over our nation. What are you going to speak? What am, I'm, I'm challenged to, guys. I'm really challenged to, you know. Chanel, I was so encouraged. We had dinner with Chanel and Jilly the other night. And it was so awesome. And you were talking about the political tension being on the border of Russia and Latvia. And you were just like, well, if there's war, I'm still called doesn't change anything. And I was like, oh, Lord, please don't call me anywhere like that. But it's such, that that's the reality. And you might be called here for a season. You might be called here for the rest of your life. But you're still called here. And you still have a role to play. And to sort of round all of this up, you know, we're talking about the prophetic. We're talking about what is God saying to us and how, we are, how are we going to respond to it? And um, I'm going to hand over to Wayne shortly. But I want to challenge you in a few areas. Maybe if you wouldn't mind quietly reflecting. And just ask God to put his finger on something that he has been trying to speak to you about. But you've just been thinking it's not him. Maybe you think it's your thoughts. What is he saying? Ask him. And if you don't understand, ask him for more. It might be a picture, it might be a word, it might be a memory. But God is doing something tonight. Brad, my friend, can we have some keys? Hezekiah, that brave king, had a choice. And he could choose faith or he could choose fear. 
and we could choose faith or we can choose fear. We don't just we don't just battle against flesh and blood. In this season for our nation, we are not just battling against flesh and blood. You need to see the person in front of you. And you need to start treating them like you want them to treat you. And like it's Jesus standing in front of you. And I believe there's so much prov- a promise over our province. I am really so excited to see what God is going to do. Guys, the prophetic words have been flowing over our nation and over our region. Where are you feeling the most devastation and desperation? What is the most hopeless for you at the moment? What is God wanting to do there? A couple of things that I felt God wanting to touch on in worship. And if any of this is you, when the space opens up, please make your way to the front. We've got, we've got a whole team of people who are so excited to help you hear the voice of God. If you have anxiety, if you're feeling uncertain about the future, if you're lacking purpose, And I feel like some of you have just been feeling so confused, like you don't even know what you don't know. You don't even know what the problem is. And I feel like God is wanting to bring clarity for you tonight. I feel like God wants to speak to people who are feeling like God has been faithless towards them, like they're dealing with everyone else and they're not dealing with you. And I even think this might be connected to a parental wound, but maybe you haven't made that connection yet. I feel like there are people who are who have been fighting really hard to heal deeply painful wounds. And I just saw the Holy Spirit helping you bypass a lot of that, that process, so that your healing would be quick and your recovery would be smooth. If you're struggling with demonic strongholds, we want to pray for you. We want to see you free. If you don't really know where you are, the role you are supposed to play in the city. We want to pray for that too. We really feel like God is wanting to move. If you're feeling lonely, if you feel like you need to understand what your prophetic potential is, we'd love to pray for you as well.